Aleda is the, an international SEO consultant and founder of Orienti and the host of Crawling Monday podcast. Gaetano is a, a growth advisor for many software companies, including Cognizum, Alice, and Datagrill. Kevin is a strategic growth advisor, creator of the Growth Memo newsletter, and host of TechBound and Contrarian Marketing Podcast. Marie runs Marie Haynes Consulting and is the host of the Search News You Can Use podcast. Mike is the founder and CEO of iPool Rank, a digital mar marketing agency trusted by the Fortune 500. And Bernard is the co-founder of ClearScope. Um, awesome. So to kick it off, who wants to define what search generative experience is? <laughs> we're all going to jump in. I don't know that any of us are experts on the SGE. You know, we're, we're all sitting here talking about this thing that we've kind of beta tested. But the SGE, as far as I understand it, is um, Google showing AI generated answers uh, first in search for many queries, not all queries. Um, and I, I'm not fully convinced that what we're seeing today is what we're actually gonna see in production. So, you know, we'll have a lot of theory probably in this talk, um, but that's my understanding is what we're seeing right now is kind of an AI generated answer, although really it's just kind of stitched together from different websites. And, uh, and then they show us some websites next to that. 100%. I agree with Mary with that what we're seeing here is like the attempt of Google to try to come up with something to compete with ChatGPT that like was first, was released first. Uh, I guess that they felt a little bit like in a position uh, that uh, to be menaced uh, pretty much as the uh, destination to search for information. And they had to come up with something that had to be integrated with the current search experience to avoid, let's say, disrupting uh, the usage of what they already have. Uh, but at the same time, their attempt, I will say, it has make, made it not necessarily as useful or uh, as good even as the Bing chatbot, right? But, but yes, I will say it's the, their attempt of, of integration of this uh, chatbot like experience within their current interface uh to yeah to to stay to stay in the in the in the competition as a search destination yeah i agree with everything that's said here like one we don't know exactly what it's going to be it's also uh you know something really early but what we're seeing is basically like a <laughs> an alpha product just to appease the market it's not even like like a lady just said, it doesn't have the same, it doesn't have parity with the other things that are out there. Um, but you know, it it isn't like a, a just a direct knee jerk reaction. Google was building this stuff in the background for a while. They have this thing called Realm, which is is basically um, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's their version of what's called retrieval augmented generation, and they've had it since I believe 2021, 2020. and it's the same. Uh, framework that's being used for both BARD and for SGE. And basically what it is, is like you feed results into a, um, a language model, effectively pre-tuning it, and then use that to get answers. And so you've got the AI snapshot, which is them being like, okay, here's your answer to this thing, like a feature snippet on steroids. And then you've got perspectives and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But to me, it's a colossal waste of time. <laughs> the unne unnecessary feature snippets on asteroid when there are already feature snippets many times even below right so yeah uh, so so they spend a lot of money to regenerate the featured snippet in some cases it's it's ridiculous but those are going to go away i don't think featured snippets are going to be there for much and, longer and the map also, packs the map, map packs, yeah, map packs like th or, that's basically a replication of the local pack what they show in sge similar even to e-commerce right like a lot of these e-commerce queries or the results that you see, they're replicated in these organic shopping results uh, at the bottom. So there's a lot of duplication going on right now um, that I don't think will happen when Google rolls this thing out in December. Let's see if they even roll it out. What, what I do really expect that they actually fix, even, even before I'll say that, are links, citations. I mean, how Happy. the hell <laughs> they didn't think of adding over, overlay. I mean, uh, the Bing chatbot, was already doing the, even something better UI wise, right? Integrating the overlay with links, external links in a much more let's let's say like um, 
usable way for not not even for a website but also for from a user standpoint right but that carousel at the top right like who will click on that is yeah anyway it's so bad I have a theory as to why Google's not showing um, links to websites in the answer, because they're clearly using the information. Like you can see it's it's verbatim that they've taken it from websites and uh, very much like a featured snippet, except that uh, they're not saying which parts come from which websites. Um, my thought, although we don't know this for sure, is that when we actually see something like the SGE Live, those answers aren't going to be um, stitched together from websites. They're actually going to be generated with AI. Um, and initially, until today, I thought it was uh, that they were going to use BARD. I mean, BARD seems to me that it was built to be in search. Uh, it's going to connect with um, with Lens, uh, with you know Google Docs, Google Drive, all those things. But um, when if we see BARD in search, uh, that's a, a different thing than the answers that the SGE are currently providing, which would um, not be directly from websites. They're trained on the uh, entirety of the internet, but not directly verbatim from websites. And today, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the article in Wired um, where Demis Hassabi Hassabis was talking about uh, the new Gemini language model. When I read this, it, it kind of, I was like, you know what, we're going to talk the, about the SGE today, but I think the Gemini will eclipse everything that uh, we currently know in search. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm, you know, kind of talking crazy talk when you start thinking about uh, everything absolutely changing, but I'd love to hear if any of you guys have thoughts on, uh, on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see dramatic change and, and just think about, well, you know, you've been talking about this a lot as well yourself, but, you know, just the things we've seen in the last seven, eight months have been such a change for everything, right? Like for, for the preceding five to six years, search was really boring. And now it's just like everything is different, right? And I think what Google is trying to figure out is what is the right UX for this? And to your point on language models, I mean, yeah. Sure, the, the language models will be more powerful. They'll be multimodal by design, so on and so forth, which is great. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to how will users consume this? And I think the the real question is, you know, how, how are ads going to perform in this environment? And we've seen, obviously, they've rolled it out to some degree, and there's a lot of companies that are in the beta and so on and so forth. But if that doesn't pick up or if that doesn't take in a way that is, you know, just as good, if not better than what we've already got. I think SGE just kind of remains, even with Gemini, it just remains this like novelty that Google has to have because Bing has it. And again, a direct reaction to what the market is doing, not necessarily is this the best product. Well, hundred percent. Like they, they have the capacity, I believe, to do something much better. But I mean, they are too scared to kill their milking cow on one hand, and then also alienate the web ecosystem out there, which is already happening anyway. But but yes, that how not to kill the ad business and milking cow. And, and that's pretty much the restriction they have. I mean, they, they should ask Apple. I mean, they have they are doing an amazing work already with their Vision Pro, like the next thing interface to you know browse and interact with like and as they did with iPod versus iPhone, right? Like they 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 have been like quite successful, like killing the previous product, the, the previous version or, or or interface before. So this is what should happen with Google. They need to sort out how to change, uh, lead the next paradigm of search and killing, let's say, a little bit the former business model that they used to have, uh, while evolving a new a, a new one uh, that will can be even more profitable, right? But I guess that they are not quite yet there. Yeah. But I think that's really part of the problem, right? It's and this is I don't think Bing necessarily was the only reason for why Google adopted this model. I think one big reason is because I saw that AI is getting so good that so many other companies can create a ton of content, which really dilutes content as a ranking factor. Uh, and I think that's a that's also in part leading search to just a different user interface than the than the kind of ranked results that we have today. But it's really getting more broadly towards getting an actual answer to your question. And I think Google, I think people at Google have seen that and are seeing that right now. And that's in part for why they say we, we're probably cutting into our own leg, but what other option do we have, right? We're not going to be Yahoo where we manually curate results and then somebody else comes around and gives the answer right away. So 
uh, I, th I, I do agree with all of you that this is a tectonic shift, that the user interface, interface for search changes, and that Google has no other option but to concur, right? They, they invented a lot of this technology, and uh, they, they always say, oh, we have this, we already have this, and we bring out so much better stuff. But it was not Google, and it was not Bing, it was none of the search engines who redefined the new interface for, for kind of this, this uh, maybe centuries a bit much, but for this decade. So yeah, I think uh, I think there's many reasons for Google try for why they try to do that, and uh, I'm convinced that they will find a way to display ads and maybe even make more ad revenue than they currently make. Yeah, I think it's possible. I just think it comes down to can they figure it out? And you know, I don't I don't take for granted or I don't take at face value that Google can at this point. Like they've they've messed up a lot of things in the last couple of years, you know. Oh yeah. Um, but to your point on, you know, the new interface, it really begs the question, is chat the best interface for information needs? And I'm not completely sold on that. You know, I, I do spend a lot of time and, you know, it's me speaking as me, like I'm not speaking for the general user, but I do spend a lot of time with like both Google and chat GPT open, but I spend more time on Google because it's like, even if I get something out of chat GPT, and even if you're using ARPRM to get it, um, uh, you know, it, you still got to verify that information to make sure that it makes sense. And so to that end, I don't really trust chat. And I know a lot of users do because it's like, oh, it's a computer. It must be right. Like we anthropomorphize it to some degree, but I don't believe that chat is the best way for us to meet our information needs. And, 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 and there is where I believe that new perspectives uh, filter comes in and let's say user created or, or cr creator driven content comes in that I think that Google is trying to blend it little by little with just a filter, just a tap, an extra uh, option, not even as visible in the main SERPs. Uh, but I believe it's, it's there, right? And all of this push of real authoritative expert content um, that they have been talking about now that we have this pretty much the massification of it that is AI generated, right? So, so I believe that it, it, it goes that way. And I totally believe regarding uh, the lack of trust that uh, the, the AI generated content or, or chatbot answers can have, because I, even with typical user experience that I tend to have with Google, not even that chatbot like, I will go many, many times when it's uh, a non-trivial decision-making process, go and take a double look at dimensions and, and, uh, and uh, visibility and profiles in Instagram or TikTok or social media presence to learn more about what users actually, or real people actually think about the brand or location or whatever, right? So 100% it makes sense to integrate that nowadays, especially with all of this conversation about how Generation Z is using TikTok, right? To, to search for information because it comes from real people, supposedly. Uh, so there, there's, there's goals that, right? But I think that the critical thing here is how you overlay that in a way that actually makes sense and make money for Google too. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced that the, the current model of SGE is the way that is the right way to consume this. It's like, I can imagine, you know, there's, there's all the voice assistants, but, and those make a lot of sense to be like, Hey, you know, what, what is the highest mountain in the world or, you know, those kinds of things. But, you know, those have already been answering that it almost feels like, you know, I want to go to like my AI assistant and ask my AI assistant, Hey, you know, do this. What's the answer to that? You know, help me write this like Excel script. And then search kind of feels like a, a completely different medium where, you know, I want to look at all these trustworthy sources and it does feel like it doesn't quite belong in the search interface. And I commonly find that just the amount of time that it spends generating, you know, I've already moved off of the SERP into, you know, that position part. one or two, right? That part. And I think that's a big part of this, this SGE thing. I know they've, they've sped it up in the last, um, you know, month or so, but uh, I, I did a bunch of scraping because that's what I do. And I've scraped like thousands of SGE results. And it was taking as many as like 21 seconds to generate a result. And a user is not going to wait that long, even if it's, you know, 10 seconds or five seconds, they're going to go to the reg regular SERP 
and click something rather than waiting for that result. So until they make it faster, until they cash it more, whatever it's going to be to get to the point of having um, those show up like immediately, it's not realistic that a user is going to wait for it. And then the ones that do wait for it, they're like, okay, this isn't that good. They're just going to go to the regular results anyway. But I think the bigger problem that we haven't really touched on yet, or to some degree we have, um, this idea of what it's going to do to publishers, and especially publishers that are in the um, affiliate space, you know, the wire cutters of the world that are like, here's my reviews on all these different things. And, you know, I no longer have to go read that article, I can go directly to that product. And so in my example, I, I look for something like, you know, what's the best microphone to record in an apartment in New York City? And it gave me very specific results. And I'm like, oh, cool, I can just read this. And I don't have to like, go you know, read three different blog posts and figure it out, that is going to have a bigger impact on the internet than any of this, I believe, because that's like the core monetization strategy for so many different publishers. RIP list posts. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say RIP list posts, you know, like even, even, even doing in-house B2B SaaS content marketing, you know, they all want to rank for modifiers containing tools, software, solution, platform, system. Very, very rare that you have a SERP these days that is not, you know, stacked with G2. What up, Kevin? Um, <laughs> all the programmatically generated comparison and list pages. And so you to play that game, you have to do list content. But I agree to Mike's point, you know, it's, it's going to be a big shakeup for those affiliate players. Um, you know, I hate, I hate to say it, but like, I would love to see sites like PC mag take a dive. You know, I, I hate those guys. Right. Like, I, whoa, I, I, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like me being as an in-house SAS SEO, I've had to pay the middleman as part of my playbook. Right. And, you know, who knows how that's going to shake things up. And I'm just really curious to see how it all plays out. But I mean, I agree with you guys that it's going to be a, a, a huge bomb on, on those, uh, on those sites. You on the middleman, 100%. But not only the middleman, in fact, I have to say, because yes, indeed, we, we can see like the ones that will like not necessarily going to have another option uh, to move forward, uh, pretty much rely on those best of type of, of queries uh, are this review sites, um, which pretty much the reasonable was affiliates. But also, if you think about it, a lot of PLPs of e-commerce websites are pretty much going to lose, lose their traffic because the PLP experience is being replicated in the, in the SGE interface uh, that is highlighting directly product uh, pages, product URLs. And coincidentally, uh, many of these product URLs, especially for branded queries, Nike sneakers, for example. Uh, if you see the top organic search results right now for Nike sneakers will be the category page of Nike, uh, a couple of other sub, uh, sub, sub PLPs of, of Nikes or whatever, and then um, uh, merchants uh, offering the same products, whatever, Nike products, whatever. Now, if you take a look at how it is going to affect the SGE, pretty much this PLP experience highlighting products is, is right there. Goodbye traffic to PLP. Um, you click on the product pages and it doesn't even refer, refer to the Nike website directly, but to the product knowledge panel, uh, and and from there to those pages are actually making a good use of the merchant center and feed and structured data optimization, whatever. So welcome to the jungle here, not only for uh, affiliates, indeed, but just for many merchants and e-commerce websites, especially the very authoritative, highly established brands that a lot of these branded queries like assume going to them by default, not anymore. It's opening up to many other competitors doing a like really good job at a much more granular, button of the funnel type of um, uh, actions out there. Google is building a marketplace for e-commerce anyway. They're already offering direct connection to checkout for merchants. So that whole affiliate thing is again, like this middleman situation, yeah. it's going to go away anyway, because Google is basically becoming a second Amazon uh, try, or trying to fight against Amazon. So, but, but I think the, the kind of core message here, or there are probably two core messages here from what we talked about so far. One is that, um, the ecosystem is changing like as crazy as ever, right? This is probably the biggest change to many of these ecosystems, whether it's publishing or e-commerce or local search ever. Number two, when we talk about content or SEO, 
one of the one of the deep questions that we are all trying to figure out is what is the human contribution to content, right? What are humans actually doing that machines cannot yet replicate? Because a lot of these AI tools, and remember, this is only a bit over six months until the like you know ChatGPT breakthrough in November. A lot of these tools are getting really really good, and even though they still need to be more oversight, they're not yet. You know, you can't just let them do the thing and publish the content cold in many cases. We can all see where the journey is going, right? And I would argue in the next 12 months, when we speak again, uh, a lot of us are probably just going to publish content with AI tools that needs tiny oversight that we can 10x the output of good writers. So then the question becomes, like, what's, what are humans actually doing that is still unique? And how can we find our unique skills and, and double down on them instead of have, being replaced by some AI? Well, I think it's more more um, sophisticated than that to some degree. And what I mean by that is what a tool like SGE does is introduces context windows into search. And effectively, what you're doing is you're creating these very personalized paths. Because when it's like, here's your first question that you've input, and then it's like, well, follow-up questions are this it can learn from what the results were in the free previous one and do this like very micro personalization for you. And so what that's really going to yield is this idea that we have to make even more personal content. So if it's, if you start from a keyword, like uh, a latest say, you know, Nike, Nike sneakers, and then a follow-up question is like, well, what's Nike sneakers to wear for the New York marathon. And then it's like, okay, it's learned about you that that is your context. And so it's not just enough to like have, you know, um, a page about Nike sneakers in general, like we generally do, and then a page about what sneakers for a marathon, you've got to have that whole path so that you end up appearing in that, uh, that pre-tuning set that's used for, you know, generating that next result. And so where we come in is, is doing that. Like, how do we understand the nuances of the specific audiences that do those specific journeys? Whereas before we were just so focused on keywords and not so focused on audience, it really just like turns up the dial on that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I see it more and more. I say it more and more. Content strategy is becoming more and more the way to think about SEO. And if I'm thinking about what's going on in the Google ecosystem, I, I, keep, I keep thinking about the manual search evaluator component, right? That's essentially the component where Google employs thousands of, of people to swipe right and swipe left on what looks like a good positive user experience. And the, the most revised version with the extra E or experience added to the, the PDF, it means that people are looking at things where it, it clearly demonstrates that like somebody has experience this in their experience you know this is what happened and it demonstrates that and you're we're seeing you know a lot of manual evaluators swipe right and say yes right that's that's a good experience so i think that we're going to see that shift play in and so yeah i mean us as seo content creators we can still leverage ai and I think that will make us more efficient, but then ultimately, right, it's back to Mike's point. Well, what is the, what is the user journey and what is the content strategy that, you know, we're architecting because simply, you know, what are the best shoes for running aren't necessarily exactly the right, like frame to put it. It's like, you know, I tried seven marathon shoes across, you know, these different marathons and, you know, here's how each of these performed and, the mm -hmm. manual search evaluators are are saying yes you know like those look good and so we're going to see i think large influxes of that which then makes purely ai content generated content without human assistant i think in its current form just lackluster in performance i think it's a really interesting point about experience we saw just this week google released the perspectives filter 
So that's uh, when you do a search on mobile, you can tap on one of those little bubbles that, you know, it used to just say news, images, whatever. And now Google's figuring out like some of those are topics that are really related to your search. And one of those is perspectives, which um, what from what I've seen so far, it's showing uh, information from YouTube, from Quora, uh, user generated stuff. Um, but that's not the only part that Google announced. And we haven't yet seen, uh, they said that they're going to be doing an update to the helpful content system, which which will uh, uh, reward content with experience in search as well, not just for those who tap on that particular filter. Um, and I really think that uh, for all of the faults that AI has and all of the, you know, we're really good at criticizing um, where language models can go wrong and stuff, uh, but like it's brand new technology that uh, it's only going to get better and better, right? So, um, so I think eventually we will get to the point where language models can very easily answer pretty much any factual question, um, even about current events, uh, especially language models that are, um, you know, Google says that BARD um, is the power of the language model plus the breadth of the knowledge of the world, the bre breadth of the world's knowledge, you know, uh, there's BARD, maybe not BARD itself, but Google soon will be able to answer pretty much any informational query um, with pretty good accuracy, I I'm, I'm fairly certain, which means that what's left, if you want to rank in search, is to actually be like the, the site or the business that people are seeking out. And I think, you know, some people are crying the death of SEO. I, I think there's two types of SEOs. There are SEOs um, who help businesses get found. And that, like, I'm so excited if that's you, because uh, the world is changing the, you know, it's going to be crazy, all the stuff that's happening. And, and those businesses still need to be found. But there's a whole camp of people that um, your only existence in SEO is to create content because of your knowledge of how search engines work, and then profit from that content. And I think for a lot of businesses, that model is like, it's done. Because, um, you know, even if some people still want to seek out your content, a lot of people are going to be happy with an AI generated answer. So, uh, you know, I think I think we're in for a lot of big changes. Um, and but yeah, if you if your business model were niche websites, affiliates, etc, that uh, yeah, indeed, like you're up to a challenge there. But otherwise, if you are doing SEO 100% to a real business with a real product that you provide, or a real service, et cetera, et cetera, uh, independently of the interface that might change, uh, you still need to be found and there will be always ways to optimize and maximize visibility and potentially the bar will get a little bit higher. So the one trick ponies that uh, uh, work today will not work very likely in, in those times. So you will need to, well, what is important is to be strategic as you will mention, to understand um, how it works, what what actually push the or move the needle in the new interface, and how you can help those businesses to to be found for those queries that are actually bearing business and and matter at the end of the day. Something interesting that you also mentioned, Mary, regarding the perspective filter, uh, that I I think it was Glenn Gate that mentioned it over Twitter, and I went and double check, is that it seems that the perspective filter is shown on mobile. Uh, whenever the search generative experience is not shown by default when when you are testing mm. the interface so it's interesting because it seems that google is let's say segmenting uh the experience and say okay this is a type of query where where it it makes more sense to show real users uh yes. perspective or or take and this is the one that we can easily generate the answer from all the information that you know is more is more factual or or yeah, uh, um, information. So one, let's right? let's go back to this Wired article that I talked about earlier uh, about Gemini that you know we don't really know much about because here we are talking about search as we know it and Gemini the way that they describe it is basically a personal assistant. Um, that can answer any question and can direct you if you need, you know, if you're looking for a particular website, then it can direct you there probably. Um, but like, I think the whole idea of websites, like we're going to one day talk about this little sliver of history that we lived in with this thing called websites. I, I, I honestly don't think that they're going to be needed for much more. Um, now, I know that's like terrifying for those of us who work on websites, but there's, there's such a... Um, where, where am I trying to go with this? That what Dennis Hassabis was saying uh, is that 
what Google is coming out with next. This is not like, ooh, we had an update like the helpful content system. This is a whole new product. That, uh, that Google is coming out with. And he described it as, sim or at least the article described it as similar to ChatGPT, but also with the um, technology that AlphaGo, DeepMind's AlphaGo used to figure out how to beat like the best Go player in the world. Um, and so they're also making it so that it um, is really easy to integrate. They talked about how their APIs are gonna be really easy for businesses to use. And so imagine that now very soon, Every business is going to have the same power that AlphaGo had to figure out Go right from the start to figure out the problems in your industry. Like that's, that's huge. Right. And so I, you know, when I read this, I, I, I feel like, how can we, um, how can we still talk about uh, web pages when, uh, you know, Google has this, and I have this quote in front of me here um, from Larry Page in 2000, year 2000 where he said, artificial intelligence would be the ultimate version of Google. This is the year 2000. So we have the ultimate search engine that would understand everything on the web. It would understand exactly what you wanted and it would give you the right thing. That's obviously artificial intelligence to be able to answer any question, basically, because almost everything's on the web. We're nowhere near doing that now. However, we can get incrementally closer to that. And that's basically what we work on. And that's tremendously interesting from an intellectual standpoint. So Google's whole goal has been to be an AI-based assistant. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know what uh, point I'm trying to make here other than to say that I think we'll look back at this conversation we had and go, wow, we had no clue what was coming uh, because uh, I, I think it's going to be changes beyond what we can comprehend right now. Yeah, I think, I think you know, in the future, we may get to that space, but I think, you know, when we think about things that uh, will tactically matter in the short term, I think we have two key problems that are going to matter to SEOs that we haven't discussed thus far. One, if SGE keeps moving in the direction that it is, where there is some sort of, um, you know, something loads and then there's something else that loads after the fact, rank tracking is over. Like no one is going to spend the money that it's going to take to track millions of keywords and then load something for 20 seconds. Like that's just not gonna happen. Two, um, content is gonna have a huge problem because if everyone is using these language models that are trained on data prior to 2021, or not even that, like even if they update their models and they start pulling in content from now, like since chat GPT came out, all of that content is effectively polluted to some degree because everyone is using these language models. And so to that end, we it, it's going to be a lot more important that you're surfacing the content that is actually valuable or new or from experts and things like that. And I think that's going to be a problem, not just for the language models, but also for search engines. And so I think that information gain is going to be a really important thing for us all to focus on. And for anyone that doesn't know what that is, like the in the audience, I'm assuming everyone up here knows, um, it's this idea that like, let's say we've got 10 documents about a subject. Okay, which of these documents says something new that the other ones aren't saying? And so being that what all these language models are doing is effectively, you know, rewording what has already been, been said more often than not, or pretty much not at all. They're not going to introduce new ideas unless they're using a model like, um, you know, any, any model that's using retrieval augments and generation. So my whole point here is that we're going to have to focus on, you know, getting clients to be the people that actually say new things when a lot of people are going to want to go in the direction of like, hey, let's just fire up this language model and spit out 500 pieces of content. And I, I don't say any of that to discount what you're saying, Marie. I think it's it's a really interesting series of, of things that are being presented, ideas. And like, you know, it's really us having more of like a futurism discussion when we're talking about all of that. And I'm really interested in what, where all that is going. But I think that there's some tactical things that we're going to need to solve between now and then. And that's still going to involve, you know, web pages. Yeah, to, to, to that point, you know, I've been trying to get information gain a part of every single SEO strategy that I do in every client project that I work on, every company that I've been a part of. One example that always comes to mind when I think about this is the query, is identity theft protection worth it? If you search that, you're going to see affiliate players saying, yes, you need it. You need insurance. Yes, you're fucked if you don't have it. Part of my French. 
we were the only company that said, you might not need it. The truth is you can do all this crap manually. So you don't necessarily need it. The only reason that you need it is if you're lazy and you don't feel like changing all your passwords manually, you don't feel like checking your credit report manually and showing them a side-by-side -side of things that you can do manually without buying a tool versus how the tool makes your life easier. We were the only company that took that approach, right? So it's easy to just go and copy and try and out machine learn everybody, you know, out muscle them with links. But you know, when you're up against US news, nerd wallet, progressive, yeah, good luck. Right. And so uh, to Mike's point on information gain that, you know, that's just one example that comes to mind, but we're all going to have to do that if we want to compete. That means that you actually need a, well, potentially a, a real expert, right. And have an opinion, a, a unique opinion on, on that 100%. Yeah. Awesome. And to Mike's point, you know, cl clients don't want to do that. It's very hard to convince a client to say, yeah, we saw, we offer this, but don't buy us. That's tough. Let's keep pulling that thread a little bit. Um, I know there's a lot of sites out there that kind of wonder, like, what can we do to start future-proofing um, our sites? Like, what what can they start doing now in preparation for SG? I think that anything you can do that demonstrates real-world experience is something to focus on. Um, one of the problems with that is that it's expensive. Uh, you know, I, I uh, recently reviewed a, a news website, and that was my top piece of advice was, look, you have almost no original reporting, no original insight. You're very good at aggregating and summarizing, uh, but Google wants to reward original reporting. And what they said was, like, the cost of that. Their, their writers are not trained to, um, uh, to be uh, original reporters. So um, uh, that, you know, for a lot of businesses, that's going to be different. Difficult. But if you can focus on what is it that you could bring, if you took your content and deleted everything that potentially um, is on other websites or could be repeated very easily by a tool like ChatGPT or Bard um, and looked at what's left, is it something that is worthy of people visiting? Uh, and so that would be my main focus right now is to see like how can we uh, demonstrate real world experience to try to be rewarded by Google. The bar will certainly be higher. And this is something that we need 100% to, to think of. And also in the format that you generate this content, right? I believe that we have underestimated a lot video content. One of my main clients right now is like is, is, is a player that really leverages well YouTube as their main channel. And pretty much what we do in Google is, is pretty like trying to replicate a little bit of what they have already created over over YouTube, right? And I, I have been waiting for this time where there is a much, let's say, natural integration of uh, video results in search. And now that we're talking about information gains and uh, easier way to find information that can be integrated better also in SGE, I can see video and, and non-text content being that, right? For visual information, a lot of how-tos that uh, right now we had a position zero that was a one video on that set. Let's let's see how that plays out with the search generative experience, right? Um, but this is another, let's say, part of the puzzle, right? Like ha having real expertise, showing real expertise and how you show that, potentially not creating yet another article that has been covered thousands of times already, but our unique take that if you identify that will be much more helpful uh, to a video format to do it in, in, in that format, right? And, and that will, will allow you also to a little bit diversify uh, channels to gain visibility to, to YouTube too, right? Uh, but yes, I, I, I am a firm believer that, for example, we have underestimated a lot non-text, formats uh, with lens also we we can see how it has been advancing a lot as a as a input channel let's say or platform but um the output will end up being many many times also also image or or, or video at some point so I, I i believe that if you ask me i will be especially with certain type of clients that have been investing a lot on guides for very obvious queries, um, uh, how to's and best of type of, of content to try to sh push them to move forward beyond that uh, with expert led content, 
uh, video related content also for e-commerce clients a lot of my e-commerce clients um, have invested a lot of improving PLPs I'm going to hey let's put a little bit of more work on those PDPs uh, now because it, it's obvious for me that a lot of the traffic and visibilities that PLPs used to have will shift um, on PDPs and that in that expert led content um, that will fulfill informational intent for many of the brands that they represent. If I can add uh, one more thing that I think uh, would be really good to focus on, actually two things, uh, is whatever changes are happening with Google ads. Uh, I'm not an ads person, but the blog posts that Google recently put out about uh, revolutionizing ads with AI is really worth paying attention to. Um, I, I can see it where uh, that's actually a big component of search is um, Google allowing people to, instead of clicking on an ad, I think you'll be engaging with the the uh, AI content of the website that you're engaged with eventually down the road. Um, and so the next thing is to look at what's available through uh, Vertex AI with uh, Google's Vertex AI. Um, start playing around with, you have access to uh, several of Google's language models to so the Palm API. There's all sorts of uh, things that can be done. Um, and I, I'm surprised that I don't see more uh, businesses talking about it. Um, Mike, you, you, you're you nodding there. Have you played around with the, I mean, obviously you've played around with the APIs, right? Yeah, I play around with all the things. Um, I mean, you know, all my thoughts are basically from neilpatel.com. So you can just go there. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. So as far as like, you know, what we should be doing, I think the first thing is that we should be looking at the queries that you care about in SGE and then see what sort of formats are starting to emerge there. Like, what are you actually seeing in SGE, like, is it actually triggering an AI snapshot? Is it, you know, doing the whole big guide thing that it does for e-commerce queries and things like that? You should also be doing that generally in the SERPs, right? Like in regular Google or whatever we're going to call it. If you're seeing more like, um, you know, the, the YouTube shorts starting to pop up and things like that, those are all things that you should start worrying about. Like, okay, this keyword is threatened. Perhaps I don't want to be here anymore because I don't necessarily... Um, you know, have the content to be competitive here anymore. Um, information game we'd already talked about. I think structured data is a huge thing. And when I say structured data, I'm not just saying like schema markup. You know, I think that uh, one thing that people don't focus on enough is the idea of semantic triples where Google is able to, you know, uh, extract information about things from actual sentences. And when they see it across the web over and over, they're like, okay, this is an attribute that hasn't been indicated explicitly in structured data. So the more that you structure your sentences in that way, the more you're giving them that information. And then as we discussed before, the idea of the multidimensional search journey. So thinking of your queries kind of in that pattern that we are already using from the people also ask idea where it's like, okay, well, someone searches for this and they search for this and then we search for this. So using that as the mapping for the content that you're going to create moving forward. And, you know, just thinking about it from like a, a personalized way. And I think a lot of this dovetails into, you know, how Google has improved this understanding of content. There's a few, something they they talked about a couple of years ago was like passage ranking or whatever. And it was something that we all were like, oh, passage ranking is so important. And then we all kind of forgot about it. I think that's still like really important. And it's a function of how embeddings work and so on. And so they're able to understand like the, the, the smaller aspects of the page a lot better. So it's not necessarily, we've got to make 500 different pages to, to capture these different topics is just do it really well on one page. And so my last point here is that the, the um, distribution of searches is gonna change dramatically. And I think it's largely a function of like, we have all been trained to use Google in a certain way. Like you don't wanna give something too specific because oftentimes you don't get the result that you want. So you start from these head terms, but with them being better at giving these more specific responses, in response to these longer queries, the head terms, the search volume on head terms is gonna get smaller and then the long tail is gonna get longer. And so really we've all got to rethink our keyword strategies in alignment with that so that we can you know, go to where users are gonna go as a result of this new user experience. And part of that is also sourcing how you, how you understand what to optimize for, right? This whole idea of optimizing for, I mean, a single keyword has been that for a long time, maybe topic is a bit more viable, but uh, what we often forget is that AI goes both ways, right? Uh, AI 
gives answers in search, but we can also use AI to be more effective. And one part of that is to just source better topics to create content for or pages for from our users, right? So there are many tools out there now that allow you to upload tons of PDFs. And so you could just go out there and use rec- uh, transcripts from sales calls or customer support calls, throw them into a tool, and then just query and ask, what are the common pain points? In fact, I have done that with a, with a, with a customer and we've created some content completely outside of any search terms or better said search terms had zero search volume. And lo and behold, when we create content for that kind of stuff, all of a sudden those pieces of content get a lot of traffic. So I think we also, we should like also use the opportunity to, to throw overboard some of our old kind of methods and workflows and think about what does an AI enable us to do now, right? Another example, lots of these uh, uh, chatbots that everybody has now, those are interactions with customers and not a lot of people log the questions that customers have and what they first ask for. So uh, we can substantially optimize our experience. I think that websites have become, most websites have become incredibly boring over the last 10 years. It was barely innovation. They all look the same. And uh, not enough people are thinking about how can we provide something truly unique, some interactions maybe. Like you can, like one example here is a Vimeo or Descript, right? That allow you to edit video or audio uh, uh, like text. And so they brought that to the landing page where you can try out little features of the product on the landing page in itself. And that is a great way to not only get people bought in before they even sign up and increase their excitement about the product, but also to stand out with a unique experience. And I really think that we need to innovate more about what a good web experience actually looks like. And AI actually gives us some great tools for that. I mean, we definitely will need to, let's say, re-educate clients, right? It it has been like quite easy, let's say, especially if we take... (sighs) generic search volume as a as a reference right uh for say okay it it has this potential uh of traffic because it has this average search volume per month this trend whatever whatever but if if it is going to become so much more segmented and spread through the long 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 tail um imagine now having to let's say invest on so many different pieces of content rather than, than a single one uh, for which many times it was a, it already required a little, bit, a little bit of like good influence right there, especially like for example, if you work with e-commerce websites to invest on informational content. Oh my God, how I am going to invest on content that doesn't bring me money directly, right? Uh, it, it, I I believe that we will see a little bit of this need of elevate a little bit our capacity to um, communicate and and show value and show the value that is going to be, be a little bit, especially at the beginning, much more complex to show on the potential, on, on being more strategic, on, on developing content that requires expertise and unique takes, for example, and that is so spread out. And it's not a single long form guy trying to run for the very popular top of the few, uh, uh, top of the funeral query that everybody wants to rank with. Right. And, and uh, you send a bunch of backlinks to uh, improve popularity and pretty much that's it right now. It's, it's not going to be so straightforward anymore. Yeah. I, I agree so much with that. You know, like, would you rather create demand generation best practices or how to allocate my demand generation spend across paid channels? That's a real problem that demand generation managers have at companies. And a part of this is also going to be about creating some demand. Like SEO has, you know, traditionally been a demand capture channel. You find volume, you create content, you rank, you get traffic, you pull it all in. Businesses now got to think a little bit omni-channel. All right. How are we going to create some of this super long tail content and get it rolling on some of these other channels uh, and use paid and organic marketing strategies together to go reach our target customers? That's the way I see it. Excellent points. And we have seven minutes left. So I want to get it to uh, an audience question, which also kind of sums up some of these like privacy concerns. But Chris asked, he works in the biomedical industry and their content is pulled from their page and reworded in SGE, oftentimes incorrectly. How should they and others combat this? I think that Google is aware of the issue um, and they've been very quiet about it you know they've said well you know the websites are on the side and you know maybe uh, just like with featured snippets 
you know, they took our, our content and then we had a link from it. And sometimes that was beneficial. And sometimes those featured snippets stole all of our, our, uh, our clicks. Um, I, you know, I think we can continue to complain, but I don't know that there's much more we can do beyond that. But then again, uh, it's possible that Google is doing nothing because this is just an experiment and what we see go live, uh, will have a language model in there rather than, um, uh, like actually have truly AI generated answers as opposed to stitch together answers. Uh, so I'm not sure what the recourse is. I, I can't see how Google could go live with um, with just blatantly taking content from everybody's website the way they are uh, and not uh, and continue that way. I, I don't know. So I, I'm with Marie, like it's not something that we can easily solve overnight, but I think it's an indication or another indication as to why the SEO world needs technical standards. And it's also the sort of thing that if we were to establish that, we could then probably you know, enforce that in different places. And what I mean by that is, how is it that the biggest search engine is defining what robots.txt is? That makes no sense. Like, why do they get to define it? Like they are crawling the web. We should be, like the web should be saying, here's what robots.txt is, and here's what you need to adhere to as a as a, a search engine. And so if we were the ones to define the technical standards, we could say like, oh, robots.txt now has a rule that means you can't use this copy for a large language model or for generating content. And being that we don't have that level of control, Google can do whatever they want. Like, can things be removed from the language model? Like, if something was whatever Google trained it on, I mean, we know that ChatGPT was trained up till 2021, right? We don't, I don't know if we know when Lambda or, or Palm or anything was, was trained up to, but if something's in there, I don't know that you can just remove it. Right, so from the language model itself, no, you can't. But for these results, they're taking, you know, whatever they have in the rankings and they're saying like, hey, use these, these pages to then create this result. And so what we, what could be, like the way I'm imagining this is like you have a meta robots that tag to, dot meta robots tag that says like no generate or something like that. And then it's the sort of thing where it's like, okay, well, this came up in the rankings. Cool. We've got to omit this result for the for the fine tuning mm -hmm. for the answer. So that's what I'm saying. It, being that we don't have the ability to define that, we're just like left to whatever Google decides they want to do. And I think it needs to go even further, right? I think there needs to be, and maybe this is something that governments of the world have to regulate, but there needs to be transparency about what data sets these models are trained on. It's not just Google that uses the web and, and index and rag to to uh, to serve AI answers. It's also ChatGPT and all these other companies that are working on models. And uh, right, so you could, for example, technically, you could say, okay, uh, like, you know, in, in robots.txt, you disallow Google from calling your site, but then common crawl crawls your website. And that's then being used to train a certain model, which then uses your, your data. So I think that's really one of the few areas where I think we need more regulated transparency so that anybody has a choice to say, I want my data to be used for training or not. And, and at a more, much more granular level, like, so for example, as uh, it was a good example, uh, the one that Mike gave regarding the feature snippet, like for example, we, with the max snippet or the no snippet, uh, we can, we can uh, specify and provide rules uh, to Google to prevent uh, them to show uh, them in certain circumstances, right? right? We need totally, and I, and I agree with you, something at a very granular level, uh, to be able to select even from a topical standpoint, right? I'm okay with this type of topics, not okay with other type of topics, things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, it will be it will be great. I have already a client uh, who's very concerned regarding Google using their data. They realize that if if they block it, I mean, there's no 100%. Uh, let's say straightforward way to do it because they rely on Google search anyway. So even if they uh, block um, um, through the chat GPT, open AI, common call, whatever, it won't necessarily affect uh, this other scenario. Um, it's it's tricky and um, it just, we don't have means right now. We don't have an answer. And yeah, it would be great that Google is going to go ahead with this new interface, new way of searching. At least they provide channels and configurations to control 
uh, that to happen. In any case, like the the, um, the type of conversation that I have with uh, this client is like, imagine that if you are able and allowed and uh, block this information, is Google and other language models not going to be able to get this information in any other way, right? And this is where uh, the expert based content comes also in hand. If you have unique information, unique content that is actually so valuable that you can control and can damage the experience of people if you're not able or willing to give it, right? Uh, so it's put for thought here. But in their case, it was like, no, pretty much they will be able to get the same information elsewhere. So it doesn't make any sense for them to try to block it in any case. Yeah, that's a good place to kind of wrap. Um, this hour went by really, really fast. Again, thank you so much for your time today. And I want to give you everybody a last, um, some last words, uh, a lady if you want to kick us off with any kind of last words before you give everyone their day back and then Bernard and kind of round the horn. Um, I think that uh, we are in this moment that uh, it's, we might be a little bit scared, but it's also very exciting at the same time. Uh, my recommendation will be to keep things strategic. Um, look, Take a look at the SERPs. That is the best advice. I would see generic overall applicable to everything, especially now. Take a look at the SERPs uh, for the most important type of search behavior that you tend to, to, to follow and, and to profit from uh, and act accordingly to what will keep the visibility up and clickability, clickability up of your clients or branch results um, and experience. And um, let's, let's be open also to what we can do in many different ways. Maybe, hey, we become creators all of the sudden, or uh, it, it can change in so many, so many different ways. And it's certainly exciting. I, I believe that in a year, if we repeat this, um, it, will, it will be interesting to see how our takes have changed and how it has everything evolved. Uh, maybe half of us, we don't call SEOs anymore, but something else, I don't know. AI optimizer, I don't know. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, Aleda, you you wrapped it up very nicely. I think the the way that I would frame it, just for everybody out there, is that Google has been cannibalizing their ecosystem since the start of search. This is just a further cannibalization of what they're already doing, you know, in the past, you would, you would have searched weather and you go to like weatherchannel.com. Now Google gives you the widget, right? Now people are searching, you know, what are my, like the best shoes for marathons. Google's generating some AI. All of this has been happening, but search has still stayed strong. And so I think that, you know, we, we need to stay on our toes. We need to understand that the medium is changing and then just be aware that search is still likely to stay around in some way, shape, or form. And we, we just have to evolve to meet where the technology keeps heading. You got time you to go in alphabetical? Words. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, great panel. Thanks to everybody for, for making it happen. I, I learned a lot just listening to all you guys. And um, I kind of agree with everything that's been said, you know, with Bernard's points, Aleda's points, Mike, Marie, Kevin, you guys all made a lot of compelling points, a lot to think about. Um, I don't think SEO is dead. I think, you know, we'll be around and uh, maybe we'll be called AI optimizers. But at the end of the day, um, we're still content strategists and business strategists and uh, uh, companies need people like us to grow and, and to get results. And so we just got to level up and stay on top of our game. That's what it comes down to. Yep. Um, I agree. I think, you know, it's, it's so hard to say what happens. We don't even have any traffic data. It's not even live in the public. I mean, SGE that is, but uh, I've been thinking a lot about how do you de-risk the future? And one way of de-risking is of building email lists or building ways to reach your customers and potential customers faster without Google being in the way. So I would optimize for three things. I would optimize for email signups, making it super simple for people to stay in touch with you and for you to broadcast to an audience. Number two, I would optimize for direct traffic. So how can you just get more people to visit your site directly and get them into a habit of coming to your site directly? And then number three, how do you optimize your web footprint? How do you optimize, you know, how do you track how often your brand is mentioned and how do you just get on as many sites as possible instead of, 
relying on one search engine to send you traffic. Marie, over to you. Yeah, I, I would like to just encourage everyone um, to be excited and to, to try the new stuff that's coming out. I think um, whenever there's a change, we are, it's natural for us to be fearful and it's natural for us to criticize. Um, you know, any new change in, in history uh, caused all sorts of, of criticism. Um, and what we often see is, uh, you know, leaders in our industry or, or, or people, um, you know, we're really good at pointing out the things that uh, these tools can't do and that they're bad at. Uh, but very soon businesses are gonna be clamoring for not critics of, of AI, but for people who actually know what to do with it. And right now that's none of us. <laughs> Uh, and so for me, I'm using ChatGPT to like make recipes. Um, my husband, who is not technically child or technically inclined at all, um, uses it for gardening, like how far apart should the peppers be planted and, and stuff like that. Um, and that might sound like, you know, okay, we're using this silly tool, but in doing that, when I want to use it to help me understand the search console keywords and figure out um, which ones actually declined after a Google update. I'm using ChatGPT to do that now, you know, uh, and so we're in the early, early stages of something that's going to be, I think, incredible. Sundar Pichai from Google uh, said that AI technology is going to have more profound changes than electricity or fire. Like that's big, you know, so, um, so I don't think we know what's coming. I would say play with the tools, uh, play around with whatever's in Vertex AI. Like I would say, go there now and just explore with it uh, and, and see what like jumps out at you. And then just keep paying attention to what's happening. Um, and I, I would encourage people to pay attention to the positive stuff because we're gonna hear a lot of negative because especially the media um, is hurt by what's happening. These changes are, are very damaging to a lot of the media. And so we're gonna hear the negative news. Uh, so I would encourage you all to just um, be trying and, uh, and be excited about what's coming. Yeah, boy, Marie, definitely stay curious, stay excited. These are really, you know, interesting times. Like I said, after five, six years of SEO being really boring. So it's a lot of real cool stuff to play with and learn more about. Um, also demand more from your tools. You know, I, we didn't really get a chance to talk about this, but, you know, all this stuff is very much built on like the semantic analysis and all of our SEO tools are still doing lexical analysis. It doesn't really make sense that, still like in the stone age on that because google's been in more in the semantic realm for the last like 10 years right um so demand more from your tools um if you're doing anything with generative ai you really got to lean into content strategy because you know a lot of people just kind of do things left to their own devices and then you've got all sorts of content problems all across the board so you really got to get your organization to be like Here's our content strategy for generative AI. Here's the tools we're going to use. Here's the workflows. Here's the governance models. Otherwise, you're just going to make a big mess. And then the other two things that we talked about, structured data, information gain. And uh, yeah, check out AIPRM. That's all I got. <laughs> awesome. What a fantastic conversation. Now, before we wrap this up, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe so you don't miss out on more great content from the industry's best SEOs, content marketers, and content strategists. The ClearScope webinar series happens every week and helps SEO content creators of all skill levels advance their knowledge. Hope to see you tune in next time.